to believe. Uh, 2020 was quite a year, and a lot of things happened in 2020. Uh, it started off with uh, my dear dad, Robert Wirt Sr., passed away just a few days from now. It'll be a year ago. And uh, then after that, it just seemed like a lot of things happened. We've gone through this pandemic, and it's been, it was quite a year, and I think everyone would agree with that. But um, one thing that I take away from 2020 is that I believe God was trying to speak to us, and he was trying to get our attention. And um, I have done a lot of soul searching, and I have really spent time in prayer to know and to hear from the Lord from myself and to to know what God is saying. And uh, there are a lot of things that we try to do uh, in modern times to try to figure out, you know, Lord, what are you saying and all this? And I was thinking about even going back and listening to old sermons and old ministers that have passed away and reading their materials and things like that. And there are some ways in which that's really helpful. But at the same time, it's kind of like stirring among the ashes uh, from a fire that once was, looking for embers. And uh, I believe God is wanting to pour the fire of his Holy Spirit out on this generation so we can hear what God is saying to us and so that we can do uh, God's will in our generation. This is a very challenging time, and I think we would all agree with that. And I believe the Lord wants us to hear what he is saying to the churches and um one of the ways that I believe we can really get it going in the right direction, and that is to uh, get back to evangelism as we understood it in the New Testament. And uh, I believe we've gotten away from New Testament evangelism and uh, calling people to repentance and making disciples, as Jesus said, that we ought to do. And... Um, I think that what's happened is Christianity's become as simple almost as raising your hand or signing a pledge card or just starting to go to church. And uh, it has created a, a situation where a lot of the things that we read about in the scriptures are not taking place. And, um, and there's a great reason for that. And that's why I started this series late last year, and it's entitled A History of Evangelism. Okay, it's based upon a book that I wrote years ago called Televangelicalism, and um, I'm just really touching upon the book. I'm not really going into it in any kind of depth. I am sharing some videos from the series so uh, that I feel are helpful, and I think maybe you will find that as well. But I've titled Session 4 tonight, The Road to Preparationism, okay? The Road to Preparationism. You say, Brother Robert, what does that mean? Well, there was a time when the pilgrims and the Puritans came to America, and these people were separatists. Um, they did not believe in the way things were happening in the Church of England, so they wanted to go somewhere where they could exercise Christianity according to the dictates of their own conscience, if you will. In other words, in a way that they believed it ought to be. And there were certain people within this group Okay, that believed that people needed to be genuine, genuinely converted, okay, genuinely born again of the Spirit. Uh, they would have said they needed to be among the elect, okay, and um, we could talk more about that. We'll touch upon it in our video tonight, but basically what it means is we, needed to, we need to be the genuine article. Um, a lot of times Christianity is viewed as signing up for like a club or like a membership or or maybe people just start doing it like you would join the 4-H club and well now you're a member. Well that's not the way it works in Christianity, okay? Uh, Christianity is a, uh, it, it is a faith in which people are born again by the Holy Spirit when they respond rightly to God in faith and in repentance. He does a work, a supernatural work. It's a miraculous work, okay, in the which a person truly passes from death to life. Now, when we say from death to life, we're talking about being dead towards God to being alive towards God and being alive spiritually. In other words, God's Holy Spirit comes in. He does a work. He takes out that old heart of stone. He gives us a heart of flesh. He begins to write his laws upon our hearts and in our minds. This is what the New Covenant is all about. 
but I'm afraid that people, uh, by and large, are, do not understand, nor are they walking in um, these realities. And, and you don't have to understand them, okay, to be born again. That's the thing. You don't have to be. All you have to do is to respond to God rightly in faith, okay? And He can supernaturally do the work in our life. But we have to start off with these first things, okay? Foundational things. And I want to just share some things with you tonight. So if you want to follow along with me, I'm going to be just doing about four slides tonight. So, and then I just want to share about a 24 or 25 minute video with you. And then I want to come back and maybe uh, have a short little discussion afterwards. But again, a history of evangelism, the road to preparationism. This is session four. Luke 14, verse 25 to 33 has been our golden text. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough, that is, enough resources to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Again, that's Luke 14, 25 to 33, talking about the importance of counting the cost when we become a Christian, okay? What does it truly take to serve the Lord? Well, I'll tell you, it takes abandoning everything that is competing with God for his rightful place in your life, okay? Uh, in the Old Testament, there was a law that said, you shall have no other gods before me, okay? It didn't mean in front of me. It meant in my presence, before me as in uh, before my face, okay? So there, you have to get rid of the things in your life that are competing with God. And that could be any number of things. It's whatever the Holy Spirit is laying his hand upon in your life, okay? The rich young ruler, for him it was his riches. Jesus told him to go and sell everything that he had, but he went away sorrowful. Why? Because he had great possessions, all right? And, uh, and it could be anything. God may lay his hand on something in your life and say, I want you to repent of that or I want you to turn away from that, so on and so forth. And we have to be willing to do it. John 3, verse 5 through 6, and then verse 8. Jesus answered, okay, speaking here to Nicodemus, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. The wind blows where it wishes, you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell from where it comes or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. You see, when the wind blows, you can't see the wind, but you can see the influence and the impact of sin, uh, of wind, rather. And what can happen is, is that when a person receives the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit comes into them, you may not be able to see visibly, okay, the Holy Spirit going into the person or anything like that, but you can see the impact of the Holy Spirit in their life. In other words, you can see the Holy Spirit guiding and directing them as it were, just like when the wind begins to blow and it will move a tree back and forth like this, okay? You can see not the Holy Spirit, but you can see the influence. And when a person is truly born again of the Spirit, you can tell, okay? God will begin moving that person in love, in joy, in peace, gentleness, all the fruit of the Spirit as we come to know them. So it's important. These are the things that we really need to emphasize in this modern time. Coming to serve the Lord requires counting the cost, recognizing the price that it takes to truly serve the Lord, and then also recognizing that everyone needs to be born again of the Spirit so they can be moved by the Holy Spirit to do God's will. Luke chapter 3, verse 4, you say, Brother Robert, how do we get there? I hear what you're saying. I realize I need to be born again. How can I be born again? Well, you have to start off just where the disciples started. They didn't start off being born of the Spirit. They didn't start off walking in the Spirit. As a matter of fact, you'll remember one time they wanted to call fire down from heaven on the Samaritans because they wouldn't receive the message of the gospel. And what did Jesus say? He said, I didn't come to 
destroy men's lives, but to save them. He told them, you don't even know what manner of spirit you're of, okay? They were thinking in Old Testament patterns. They were thinking in Old Testament, Elijah calling fire down on, on the prophets of Baal and all, and that's not the way in which God was moving. He was coming to draw men to himself, to reconcile men to himself. But this process began with a voice, and that voice was John the Baptist. He was the mouthpiece of God that began speaking after 400 years of prophetic silence. You see, he began calling the people to repent. He, he lived in the wilderness. He had separated himself from God. He was a Nazarite from birth, and he was completely committed to God, almost like a priest would be committed. And he had a message from God, and he had a, a if you will, a project to do, and that was to call the people to repentance, to make straight the path of the Lord. The Lord was coming into the earth, and it was his job to get people ready to receive the Lord once he came. You say, well, what did he do? Well, let's first look at Luke 3, verse 4. As it is written in the book of Isaiah, the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his paths straight. Okay, he told the people they were a generation of vipers, all kinds of stuff that you would thought would have provoked them to hostility, and to some it did. But to others, it resonated in their heart. They knew that they needed to turn from their evil. They knew they had done wrong, and they wanted to get their heart right with the Lord. And I made this comment here in the middle. I said, the early church members were prepared to receive Christ by hearing and receiving the word of repentance and fruits worthy of repentance. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, when John the Baptist gave them directives, he told them what to do. He said, the ax is now laid to the root of the tree. We're going to look at that in a moment. Every tree that does not bring forth good fruit is to be hewn down and cast into the fire. Well, he preached to them fruits worthy of repentance. In Acts 26, Paul preached this exact same message even towards the end of his ministry. He was still preaching it. So this is not a message that's worn out. It's not something that uh, we can say, well, we've moved past that now. Oh, we're in the New Testament era. Well, so was Paul. And Paul preached it everywhere you went. You skip over this step, and you're never going to get to what we talked to about in the first um, section. We're never going to get to being born again, because this is the first step in that direction. If you're ever going to bear fruit in your life, the first fruit that you ever bear is fruits worthy of repentance. And that's the message of John the Baptist and of Paul. Again, Acts 2 verse 41 they were preaching the message of repentance, and what happened? Then those who gladly, there it is, gladly received his word, were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Notice what it said. They gladly received his word. See, this is the attitude that we have to have. If we want to see change, if we want to be right with the Lord, then we have to gladly receive what the Lord is saying to us and what he is speaking to us, particularly from his word. And it can come even through the preaching of the gospel by other ministers. Matthew 3, 7 through 12, again, going back to the message of John the Baptist, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee the wrath to come? You see that? He preached the wrath of God. Just like Paul, when he reasoned with them of, of, of righteousness, of, of temperance, and of judgment to come. Who warned you to flee the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that God is able from these stones to raise up children from Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Trees is symbolic of people. Okay, fruit is symbolic of what your life yields, what your personality, what your character is like, okay? Uh, every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and is thrown into the fire, okay? This is certainly a picture of eternal judgment. 
I baptize you with the water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Okay, so here he has it in, in this passage of Scripture, the solution to everything. The first thing that's going to happen, I want you to see this, is that you repent, you bear fruits, or you bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. Okay, in other words, God puts his hand on something in your life, you turn away from it. All known sin, you turn away from. Okay, you rep re repent and you renounce those things. Okay, that's sort of the first step. That's sort of the primer. But then here's the next section. And this is what brings you into the new covenant. This is what brings you to the place where you can begin bearing fruit, okay, in your life. Not just fruit of repentance, but fruit. That is the fruit of the Spirit. I baptize you with water into repentance. He comes after me. He's mightier than I have sandals. I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He will baptize you into the Holy Spirit. We'll, we will be baptized into Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. And when, once we are in Christ, okay, once we are filled with his Holy Spirit, then we can begin to yield the fruit of the Spirit, which is really just the character of, of godliness, the character of God, the holiness of God. He, he begins to work that out in us, okay? His winnowing fork is in his hand. He will clear his threshing floor. He will gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So you see that there is a refining process that takes place once we receive the Holy Spirit. So there are several pictures here, but the, the basic of it, basics of it is this. Once we turn to Christ, once we truly repent, we, we can be baptized in water at that point, or uh, we can receive the Holy Spirit. It just depends. If a person is at a place where they can receive the Holy Spirit, God is liable to do the work very suddenly. But in some people's case, and maybe even in mo many people, not most people's case, there is a time of preparation that takes place. It was certainly true with the disciples. They spent all of that time hearing the word of the Lord, responding to it, and being prepared to ultimately receive the Holy Spirit that took place in Acts chapter 2. So that's what we're talking about. Some people, they may be ready right now to receive the Holy Spirit, and repent, and so on and so forth. But there are other people that God does a work in their life, and it may take some time. It may take hours. It may take days. It may take weeks. It just depends. But once a person is no longer resisting the Holy Spirit, once they are submitting to the Holy Spirit, once they are receiving the word that they are hearing, okay, and they are not resisting God, then they are in a place where they can receive the Holy Spirit. So you have it right here. In Matthew chapter 3, 7 through 12, that's the entire process. The fruit under repentance leads to receiving the Holy Spirit, which ultimately leads to bearing the fruit of the Spirit. Amen. But there are some things that are also important that I want to uh, speak to tonight, but I won't share them uh, just, just through the presentation. I just want to share a video with you. It's about 24, 25 minutes long, so if you just want to Stay tuned. I think you will find it very helpful and very edifying. We'll come back to it uh, here in just a moment. Although there were many positive steps back towards Book of Acts Christianity that were brought about through the Reformation, there was one particular doctrine that was developed by Augustine that was enhanced and built upon by the Reformers. This doctrine we know commonly as predestination. It is also known as election, sometimes known as unconditional election. In order to understand the doctrine of predestination or election, it is important to understand some of the false teachings that existed during the early church. One such teaching is Gnostic dualism. This is from the Greek word gnosis, and it means knowledge. Dualism views the world in terms of opposing forces, that being light and darkness, flesh and spirit, etc. The good God created all things spiritual, that being light, and a demiurge, 
created all things material, that is, darkness. Therefore, the material or physical world is bad, and the spirit is good. New Testament writers were already combating Gnostic dualism in their writings. Many writers have concluded that Gnosticism was emergent in the churches in the background of several New Testament books, such as Colossians, Ephesians, the Pastoral Epistles, Peter's Epistles, and Jude, but especially 1 John. Since the material is bad or evil, spirit and soul were separated from flesh in Gnostic thought. This gave rise to heresies related to the incarnation of Christ, for example. One form of Gnosticism may have had a lasting influence on Christian doctrine due to Augustine having studied it for some ten years before converting to Christ. That Gnosticism is Manichaeanism or Manichaeism. Scholars are increasingly pointing out the relationship between Manichaeanism and Augustine's theories related to God's absolute sovereignty and election or predestination. One scenario works this way. Because matter is inherently evil, then all of man's actions are evil. Therefore, man is incapable of doing good. Man is incapable of doing anything but sin. This naturally leads to a doctrine in which God must regenerate a person before they can choose to respond to the gospel. This is a step beyond Tertullian, who affirmed that, quote, our entire being was changed from its original wholeness to rebellion against God when Adam fell. Or in the middle of the third century, Cyprian, who insisted that human nature was corrupted through the fall of Adam. Although Augustine experimented with skepticism, Manichaeanism, and Platonism, he had known Christian teachings since childhood because his mother was a Christian. He claimed he was unable to make a decisive step towards full belief. He is known for praying, quote, Grant me chastity, but not yet, unquote. Then at some point, in a way he could only attribute to God's grace, he was made capable of accepting and following Christianity. When he became a theologian, he kept this experience central to his theology. Our systematic theologies that have come about over the years were generally brought about in response to what were perceived to be heresies. This is particularly true when it comes to a man by the name of Pelagius. You see, he didn't believe in the concept of original sin as we come to know it today. So Augustine, in response to many of his teachings, set about to establish the doctrine of predestination or election as we come to know it today. Because Pelagius was considered to be a heretic, it is difficult to know with certainty exactly what his theology was as it relates to sin and free will. We do have excerpts that are contained in rebuttals that were made against him. It seems as though, however, that Pelagius believed that when a person has chosen to sin, they could have chosen not to sin. To us, this may seem to be common sense, but for the last 1500 years, this has been a controversial point in theology. Augustine countered that everything that man does apart from God's grace is to a lesser or greater degree sin. This means that Augustine believed that all unregenerate people cannot not sin. If they cannot not sin, how can they accept the grace of God and become a believer? Such a step 
cannot be sin and therefore falls beyond the realm of possibility for fallen man. Augustine's doctrine effectively means that human beings cannot desire God unless God causes them to desire Him. Emphasize the word causes. He believed that God moves the will of man by a, quote, soft violence, unquote. The question then becomes, what about those who do not believe? Do they resist the grace of God? Augustine's theology that eventually morphed into today what we know as Calvinism says, no, they did not resist. For Augustinians and Calvinists, it is impossible to resist God's grace because it logically follows that those who did believe would have done so from their own free will rather than God's grace. From this point forward, the notion of simply responding to God in faith by one's own free will will be considered works in Calvinistic theology. In other words, Augustine's theology following the Gnostic dualism in Manachianism, that all material is evil and therefore incapable of anything but sin, salvation therefore must necessarily be 100% on God's part. We know this as monergism and nothing on man's part which would imply synergism. This theology agreed with Augustine's experience, but will be challenged repeatedly through the centuries by people who have been derisively labeled as Pelagian or semi-Pelagian. There's an acronym that's worth remembering that helps to describe the five tenets of Calvinism. That acronym is known as TULIP, T-U-L-I-P. It stands for T, the total depravity of man, U, unconditional election, L, limited atonement, I, irresistible grace, and P, the preservation or the perseverance of the saints. Most Christians who are familiar with their Bible but are unfamiliar with the teachings of Calvinism are mortified or at least shocked in their sensibilities when they learn what Calvinism actually teaches. First, the T or total depravity of man suggests that all people are dead towards God in such a way that they are incapable of doing anything but sinning. Their freedom, their freedom of the will that is, is only limited to do things that are sinful. Secondly, unconditional election. This means that God, for reasons known only to Him, elects some to salvation and others to damnation. That is, they are left to continue on in their sins. And He does that without any consultation of any future knowledge of what one may or may not possibly do in response to the gospel. L is limited atonement. This is the belief that Jesus did not, underline the word not, die for the sins of the whole world, as the scripture clearly teaches, but only in fact died for the elect. Then we have I for irresistible grace. This is the suggestion that God's grace is not resistible. In other words, when God moves upon a person in grace, they are carried along to do His will, respond to the gospel, and believe in faith. And then finally, P, or perseverance of the saints. This is sometimes called preservation of the saints. The reason why we have this distinction is that the old Calvinists believe that people must repent of their sins and must live a godly life if they're to have any kind of assurance that they may in fact be one of the elect. However, free grace is the teaching that a person does not need to repent of their sins, does not need to live a holy life, but if they will only in fact 
give an assent of the mind in terms of belief of the gospel that that is sufficient to determine that this person is in fact one of the elect and because they are one of the elect they can never be lost even if they abandon the faith they are still saved the old Calvinists did not believe that they believed that if a person was truly elect they would persevere in righteousness until the end. Modern day proponents of free grace theology have simply taken Calvinism to its logical conclusion. If God has in fact from the foundation of the world elected some to salvation for reasons known only to himself and the rest to damnation for reasons known only to himself the only thing we need to know is who are the elect. Free grace theology proponents basically are suggesting that the way we know who the elect are is who in fact believe on Jesus Christ. If a person simply turns in faith to Jesus Christ, then they are considered, according to those who espouse free grace theology, as one of the elect. Therefore, they can never be lost they are eternally secure. Whether they continue to live for the Lord, whether they repent of their sins, whether they believe in holiness, it makes no difference. They could even abandon the faith and become apostate, and yet still they are the elect, or they are still saved. Again, this is the logical conclusion that Calvinism has been taken to by certain groups in modern society. Understand that there was a group within the churches of England who would not at all have agreed with the doctrines of free grace theology. These people came to be known pejoratively as the Puritans. They believed that the churches ought to represent what Augustine's idea was of the invisible church within the visible church. Basically meaning that the church needed to be genuine Christians or maybe what they would have called the elect and that ministers ought to be true and capable ministers of the gospel. They shouldn't be people that had other kinds of occupations that were not really theologically based. And because of this fact, they were sort of looked down upon. They were thought of as troublemakers. And from that group came another group that we've come to know as separatists. These were people who basically were not willing to wait around while the church was being reformed but rather they separated and started churches of their own. Small churches at first, few in number, but they begin to grow over a period of time. The Puritans were concerned that masses of people were attending meetings on Sunday and even partaking of the Lord's Supper, but were not even right with God. A 1593 Edinburgh, Scotland register entry reads, What a pitiful thing it is to come into a meeting with one or two thousand souls and not be able to find four or five who can give an account of their faith in such a way that it could be said, quote, This is a Christian man. He is a child of the church. Unquote. How could such depravity plague the church? It all comes down to ministers fulfilling their duties before God and man. When the ministers are sinful and unrepentant, they are not likely to enforce important regulations in the churches. Consequently, men came to the Lord's Supper in a sinful state, and since the authority to deal with such issues was in the hands of bishops, the Puritans were helpless to correct these errors. They complained that the bishops' courts were excommunicating good men for minor offenses while allowing adulterers and thieves to go unpunished. As far as the Puritans were concerned, the bishops were obstacles to reformation. When Puritan John Udall rebuked a bishop saying, You are in league with hell and have made a covenant with death, they executed him. We must bear in mind that for centuries, church and state were one united entity, not divided as they are today. While the majority of Puritans 
believed that they could utilize the government to cleanse the church from its shortcomings, a minority group was not prepared to wait. They took an altogether different approach. This minority, though keeping themselves subject to the government, believed that the English church, like the Roman Catholic Church, was beyond reform. Their approach was to start new churches in which the wicked and the willfully ignorant were excluded. As early as the 1560s, there were a few groups that started to assemble. For example, in 1580, Robert Brown started a church and was the first to defend the practice of separating from the Church of England. Those who subscribed to this approach were called separatists. Although Brown later recanted of his views, those who separated were also called Brownists. The separationists themselves preferred to be called Brethren of the Separation. Although the number of separatist churches was small in the beginning, they learned how to function independent of the Anglican hierarchy. This allowed them to test novel concepts many years before other Puritans that chose to remain in the Church of England. The non-separatists did make progress in various places throughout the country. Some were allowed to choose their own pastors for their local churches. This gave weight to their argument that errors within the Church of England were not a sufficient reason for separating from it. The non-separatists accused the separatists of schism. The separatists countered by claiming that they were not guilty of schism because the Church of England was no church at all. They based this claim on two grounds. First, the Church of England lacked the essential characteristic of a true church, that is, a means of employing church discipline, and the power to exclude unworthy members. Second, it had never been a church because it had been improperly established with improper people. This meant that they did not consider the Church of England to be governed or attended by true Christians. A true Christian, according to the separatists, was a person that demonstrated evidence of conversion. Unlike the Anabaptists that had requirements for joining the church, the separatists charged John Calvin with sweeping saints, sinner, and the ignorant alike into the church at Geneva. They likened the practice to the wholesale conversion of the realm of England after Mary's death, when Papist and Protestant were all brought into the church. They insisted that this was no way to form a church. The separatists believed that a church must begin voluntarily with persons worthy of worshiping God. These persons must not only believe, but also strive to live by God's word. In order to enforce this ideal, all church members were required to submit to church discipline. This could not be done by government compulsion or by constraint of sinners, but by the free consent of believers. These reforms would serve to form a church of real believers rather than force everyone indiscriminately and by government decree into the church. The separatists had three requirements for admission into their churches. First, profession of faith, second, subscription to the covenant, and third, righteous living. As the separatist churches formed, they insisted that they be independent of one another and not subject to a higher church authority. This was the forerunner of congregationalism. They were to enjoin themselves to a covenant agreement. They were to be supported by voluntary contributions and not by tithes or by contributions of the civil government. These churches could form with as little as two or three persons, but no more than could reasonably assemble in one place. In their worship services, they stressed spontaneity, even allowing members to give a prophecy after the sermon. These prophecies were short, extemporary sermons. The separatists had many other beliefs, but this brief sketch will suffice for our purpose of understanding how their influence contributed to our quest for Book of Acts-style evangelism. In 1620, a group of separatists that had traveled to Holland boarded the Mayflower and traveled to what is now Massachusetts. 
Understand that these people came with the desire to see what Edwin S. Morgan would term as the visible saints living out the life of the invisible church right here in the New World. Ten years later, in 1630, a group of Puritans traveled across the ocean to the New England colonies in order to help perpetuate this notion of a city upon a hill. Understand in those days that in order to be a member of a church, you had to be able to give what was known as a conversion narrative. This was basically an explanation of how a person truly came to Christ. If you could give a conversion narrative that was convincing, that people would believe, then you were considered a visible saint, in other words, one of the elect. If you could not give this conversion narrative, then you could not join the church. This had serious implications. For one, in order to vote in those particular townships, you had to be a member of a church. So you can see how this would be fraught with all kinds of difficulties. Nevertheless, we have returned at this juncture in history to the notion that a person, in order to truly become a member of the church, has to have undergone genuine conversion. And they need to be able to articulate that conversion in a way that's meaningful and convincing. John Calvin emphasized that it is impossible in this world to know whether or not a person was truly one of God's elect. Nevertheless, he did furnish a list of things in which a person could look at as criteria to determine their chances, if you will. Understand that this was a time very unlike our time today. In modern times, it's not unusual at all for a minister to tell someone that they're saved if they go through a series of steps, such as saying the sinner's prayer or uh, something of that nature. Nevertheless, in these days, and truly up until about the last 100 years, no one was ever told that they were saved. It was left up to the individual to have the assurance in themselves that they were saved. As a matter of fact, conversion could ever only be thought of as hopeful. Therefore, you will see in writings relating up to the 1900s, the language of hopeful conversion. Hopeful conversion. It was the word that was used for hundreds of years in place of what we say today as say. If an anxious sinner would have asked the Puritans, what must I do to be saved? They would have discovered two basic camps of people within Calvinism during the late 1500s and 1600s. One group believed that God regenerates people spontaneously and without any effort on their part. The second group believed a person could prepare themselves to receive grace. In other words, though a person cannot earn grace, they can prepare for grace. During this period of preparation, one is subjected to the Word of God in sermons, prayer, and worship, with the hope that Holy Spirit conviction of sin, humiliation before God, and fear for one's own soul as a condition will result. For strict Calvinists, this approach implied a human element in salvation and should be utterly rejected as synergism. Some denounce their approach as Arminianism. Nevertheless, as we will discover, preparationism, though denounced by strict Calvinists, was an important step back towards Book of Acts style events. All right. Well, there are th three things that I want to take away from this video tonight that we have just watched, and they're towards the end. And first of all, that is the concept of giving a conversion narrative. 
Now, a conversion narrative is when a person is able to articulate how they got saved. For example, if you're asking me, Brother Robert, what were the conditions under which you got saved? What happened? I would say, well, the Lord began dealing with me. I began reading God's word. He started dealing with me in my heart. I started recognizing that I was a sinner. He started, God started putting his hands on certain sins in my life. I repented of those sins, and uh, God started bringing me underneath of his authority, and then ultimately I received the Holy Spirit, and I was never the same after I received the Holy Spirit. My life completely changed. God gave me a whole new desire, and though I have many times needed to repent, or what we would say have a time of personal revival, since then, the fire has continued to burn, and God has continued to do a work and deal with me in my life, and I've just never been the same since. That was a uh, inflection point in my life, to say the least. It was a watershed event uh, when I truly received the Lord. It was very unlike the many times as a child when I would just maybe say the sinner's prayer, go forward to the altar, whatever, and was never changed. So if I were giving a conversion narrative, I would say something along that line, and everyone has a different of course, uh, you know, explanation of what happened when they got saved. But I believe we ought to be able to say, you know, I can tell you when the Lord changed me. I was never the same after that. And I haven't gone back to the old ways. I have continued to serve the Lord. And um, maybe there's been times you had to repent, but you certainly didn't go back to who you used to be because you were transformed. If any man or woman be in Christ, they are a new creature. The former things pass away and all's become new. So we have a conversion narrative that the Puritans and others uh, expected uh, people to have. Now, and in some cases, it was required for church membership. And we could go into that in more depth, but we won't. The second thing is the concept of being hopefully converted or the term hopeful conversion. Now, this was the language that was used in place of what we use today when we say someone, quote, got saved. See, no one was ever told they were saved uh, in old times, okay? This was an invention. Uh, it started out sort of like this. Well, on the authority of God's word, if you believe this, this, and this, then you are saved. Well, people wouldn't do that. Uh, ministers wouldn't do that. As a matter of fact, if you read the old writings that uh, give counsel to what they call anxious sinners, they will tell you, do not tell the person they are saved. Uh, let God deal with them. Let God bring them to the place to where they, in their own heart, uh, recognize that he is, uh, has, sa has saved them. In other words, if you ask me, Brother Robert, are you saved? I don't need somebody to tell me I'm saved. Because I know in my heart God has forgiven me. I know God has saved me from my sins. So uh, other people aren't telling me, I'm telling them. See, and that's the difference. Um, we could go into that more in depth. And then uh, the third thing um, that that I want to look at, and we'll talk about this maybe more in the weeks to come, is the concept of preparationism. And that's what I entitled this session about, the road to preparationism. That preparation, rather. That means you're preparing yourself, okay, to receive the grace of God. And this is something that certain groups within the Puritans believed. Some will say, well, they were really a fringe sect of people who believed it. Not many did. Well, there were quite a few who believed it. As a matter of fact, uh, Jonathan Edwards' grandfather, Solomon Stoddard, was one of the great preparationists uh, of society and there were in, in America, and there were others. But nevertheless, because Calvinists didn't believe that a person could do anything, works-based to, to uh, be saved, they could prepare themselves to receive grace, okay? They could listen to sermons, they could read the Word of God, so on and so forth, to put themselves in position so that God could deal with them. Solomon Stollard believed that you could receive grace by coming to the communion table, which was a really novel idea, certainly. But uh, nevertheless, these three things um, are things that I think that we ought to take away from this session tonight. So I just want to end in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're just so grateful to come together tonight on this first Saturday of 2021. Lord, I pray that each and every person that is watching this tonight will truly turn to you with all of their heart, that they will start out 2021, Lord, 
having totally repented of their sins, having stopped resisting the Holy Spirit, Lord, and to just invite you into their heart and into their life, Lord, so that the and ask the Holy Spirit to come into them, Lord, that they would be born again of the Holy Spirit, that they would be transformed and changed and be able, even as we talked about in this study tonight, Lord, to have a conversion experience, one that they could articulate, that they could share as a testimony. They could give a testimony of how they were truly saved and that they know that God had done a work in their life. Lord, I pray that there, not one listening to this message, whether now or in the future, Lord, that they would be lost, but Lord, that they would truly repent and be saved in Jesus' precious name. And everyone said amen. Again, thank you for joining me tonight. And I appreciate you coming and, and being with us. And I wish each and every one of you a most happy new year. God bless you and thank you for being with us.